Okay, so what I'm be talking about is uh, modeling more conventional style macro in the sense it's you know uh, GDP, employment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, rather than the Godley table. But I show how to bring Godley tables in at the, la the last section here, and I want to show modeling of energy as well. But I want to start with where why neoclassicals are so obsessed with the way they model. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the basic reason is because they think, and we agree with them, ISLM is shit. Okay? Nobody was satisfied with ISLM at the end of macroeconomic theorising. Absolutely. Good one. Okay? And then we get this, tied together with microeconomics. You know? And that's where they go wrong. Because what they've turned, they've turned macro into applied micro. There's only one problem. Macro cannot be applied micro. But they don't know that. So after the global financial, they, 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 if you have any dealings with neoclassical economists, they were so confident they had it all right before the financial crisis, including people I knew in the Bank of England. You know, models are right, they're bringing the inflation down. It's all because of us, the great moderation. We caused it. Aren't we wonderful? Oh, what the fuck happened? Okay. And after it happened, there had been a shock. I met Blanchard. I don't know. Olivia Blanchard and I had some interactions on Twitter. He's been pretty decent, I must say. Quite approachable and, and willing to have a conversation, but still unable to listen into a non-orthodox <laughs> way of thinking. Um, so he wrote a paper which he'd consulted me and a range of other people on, uh, and he started off by saying, well, uh, like in 2008, he wrote a paper saying the state of macro is good, quote unquote, that was the title. And it was published one year after the financial crisis began, August 2008 was published. August 2007 is when the financial crisis began, which I find quite incredible. Anyway, after the whole thing, they were a bit softened up. He actually put out a paper called Beware of Dark Corners. Okay? The only trouble is neoclassical economics gave you no idea of where the dark corners were. You know? But anyway, he came out with this paper trying to aggregate a range of people's views, and he said, you know, yes, it's, we should have a foundation, and I agree with that. But then he says, it has to be micro. Because, where else can you start from? Okay. Well, whoops again. Now, the reason you can't start from micro to build macro is complexity. And this is something which is abstract to most people, but it, I think the best person in making it concrete was a, a, a guy with a genuine Nobel Prize. Okay. This is in physics, Philip Anderson. And he was one of the leaders of discovering complexity and, and formalising it in physics. And he said that the, the beautiful point he made is reductionism <coughs> is a major way in which humanity has learned about the structure of the universe. He said reductionism does not imply constructionism. And that is, the ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. But that is precisely what neoclassical have been trying to do. So this lovely line saying psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry, and of course micro is not applied micro. Okay? So I want to illustrate you know, why that isn't the case. And of course their micro is rubbish anyway, which I'll never admit, but you know, no bearing with the real world. So what actually happens when you have a higher level built on a lower level, like for example biology built on chemistry, if it was possible to build the higher level from the lower level, a sensible question in the biology exam was, please take these chemicals and create life. Okay? So there's a whole range of research needed at the higher level, which is as fundamental in its nature as any other, and that applies even if we had sensible micro, the sort of stuff Fred Lee used to do, even that micro would be, you couldn't derive macro from it directly. There'd be com complex interactions coming out of it. There was a great example on Twitter a couple of days ago, it's a BBC, um, a mini documentary about the bizarre nature of water. Now what is water? Okay. It's a combination of two hydrogen molecules which become, become a gas at about a minus, pretty close to minus 200 degrees Celsius and one oxygen at, at, at a molecule, uh, at, at atom, also uh, becoming a gas at about minus 200 degrees Celsius that is liquid to 100 degrees Celsius okay, that expands when it gets colder unlike virtually other fluid. So that you cannot explain the characteristics of water by extrapolating from the characteristics of hydrogen and oxygen. Okay? So the whole idea of micro foundations is just wrong. You've got to have macro foundations. Uh, and it also has to be three dimensional. And this is something again which is important in terms of complex systems. And 
this is, again, this is why I really recommend if you're going to do mathematical modeling in economics, learn mathematics from mathematicians. Do not learn it from other economists, even from me, okay? Uh, because it will be incomplete knowledge, uh, particular areas will be amplified to become the entire syllabus when they're the wrong thing to choose upon. Uh, these absences in the knowledge. So I, I did a full honours degree in maths while I was doing my PhD. Uh, and I learned a lot. I've, I've forgotten far, almost as much as I've learned, courtesy of spending far too much of my life fighting nonsense by neoclassical economists rather than building on sound foundations. But one of the most important papers is by Lee and York called Period 3 Implies Chaos. And what they show is the, you, to get genuine complexity, so chaotic behaviour, etc., etc., it has to be more than two dimensions in continuous time. And that's, uh, I know you look at that statement and, you know, uh, what the hell's being said there. Well, I want to give a bit of an illustration. So it's a property of the nature of dynamic systems, again, working in continuous time. I'm, you'll find I'm a, a great critic of working in discrete time. Uh, but if you have a, a, sol a solution to a differential equation, or it's even a simulation of that equation, and you have different initial conditions, one absolutely essential characteristic is those, those different paths cannot intersect. You can draw what's called a phase diagram and you show all sorts of rotations, convergence and stuff like that, but those lines cannot intersect. You've made an error if you simulate and get that result. Now, if you have one differential equation, that means you can <coughs> converge to a particular value on the number line. You can go to minus infinity or plus infinity. That's it. Okay? Uh, with two, well, you've got to draw paths that don't intersect. And the analogy that I use is, imagine I told you to draw on uh, paper or on, on, on your desk in front of you, run your finger around without taking it off the paper and without intersecting your path. Okay? Now, you've got basically three choices. You're either going to spiral in towards an equilibrium point, diverge from that equilibrium, or end up in an orbit around the equilibrium. That's it. Those are your only choices. Now that's interesting, better than the number line stuff, but it's still not the true complexity we see in the real world. Now, when you have three dimensions, exactly the same real bit in a box, okay? You can go not quite anywhere because the system will constrain what's available, but that's why you get genuine aperiodic <coughs> behavior out of a deterministic system when you're working in three dimensions. Now, this was actually first discovered by one of the world's, and I mean in terms of Newton, Aristotle, Archimedes, one of the world's great mathematicians, Poincaré. He solved what's called the many-body problem, which was Newton's equation for gravitational attraction is based on one, on two objects, a sun and a, and a planet, and therefore they'll move in elliptical orbits. But of course we have more than one in our solar system. And that is therefore means that even though it appears to be Newtonian, at the high level it's chaotic. And I've literally seen a demonstra an argument by a professor of astronomy saying, if you move your pen from here, your pen or mouse from here to here, that will change the location of Saturn in 500 million years. Okay? Gravitational complexity. So that was the solution, that there is no solution, but Poincaré proved that this class would in in inter intersect infinite number of times. Now, the first time we actually saw that, that was, of course was well before anybody could compute or calculate, even with the old fashioned computers, which were rooms full of women doing numbers on, on tables, which applies right back to the, uh, to the Apollo project as well. But once you had a genuine, com you know, a, a, a mechanical computer that could do this, we discovered it with Lorenz. So you would have heard of what's called the butterfly effect. The reason he called it a butterfly is when you graph it in two or three dimensions, this is a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional system, it looks like a butterfly's wing. It's absolutely gorgeous. But if you turn off one of those dimensions, that's what you get. I'll just bring up Minsky and demonstrate that. And I think I'm going to bring up the old version here because I've got a, another program called Ravel that I haven't talked about which gets in the way of the latest version of, of Minsky. Uh, but if I run this with... Uh, what is that on? OK. Uh, 3D, let's see. So you see the beautiful butterfly effect. Now, if I turn off one of those dimensions, this is using a switch. I'll just, I'll just zoom in a bit here. Notice that block there? That's our logic switch. So you can have logical conditions, and they can turn that on or off. Now, if I... Um, just hang on. OK, drag this down a bit. If I turn that from, say, yes to no for 3D, 
So it's now 2D, and then simulate it again. This is what you get. So you can see it's spiralling towards an equilibrium given those parameter values. So that's the difference between 2D and 3D. Okay? In so many words, 2D is boring. So that's what we need to do, go 3D. Now, so you, you'll get cyclical behaviour in a 2D model, but it's going to be limited in those ways that I spoke about. The, the, the three basic characteristics, that's the range of behaviours you can get out of it. So you need to have a three-dimensional system. Uh, but how do you start? What is your foundation? We can actually drive macro directly from macro. You start from definitions that can't be challenged. So like the employment rate is the number of people with a job divided by the population. That's its definition. That's why I'm using the logical equal sign there that is defined to be lambda, which is my employment rate symbol, is defined to be labour divided by population. Wages share of GDP is defined to be wages divided by GDP. Now you differentiate that with respect to time, and I, I know differentiation, most of us do differentiation, but it tends to be, you get a bit caught up in it. Uh, mathematicians, and this is, this is working with a friend of mine, Matthias Griselli, they use, they use simple rules, okay? they make it half and laborious. If you use the symbol, you see a hat over a, a symbol in a mathematics paper, it normally means a 1 over x dx dt. Percentage rate of change, minus the percentage uh, 100 multiplier, of course. Uh, so if you have x times y in percentage terms, that's equal to the sum of x plus y. Okay? If you have x divided by y, that's to equal to x minus y. Very simple. So it means you can actually do this stuff mechanically and very rapidly and start from something like, OK, let's define the employment rate as the rate of change of the ratio of labour to a population, which is therefore the, the that is therefore equal to the rate of change of labour minus the rate of change of population. And basically, it's saying the employment rate will rise if employment grows faster than population. The wages share, same story. Wages share of output will grow if wages grow faster than GDP. Well, duh. OK? OK? Now, that's just stating those things in dynamic form. So if you want to make it into a model, you have to make some def more definitions as it happens, but also some genuine simplifying assumptions. Okay? Not the crap that neoclassicals do, okay? where they're simplifying assumption to create the demand curve is we're all identical and so are the goods we consume, okay? which is a, a proof by contradiction their models don't work. Stuff like this. So you have the output to labour ratio. I, I don't call that labour productivity, by the way. Because so far as I'm concerned, it's not the labour these days is operating machinery. Okay, it's the machines that are generating the energy that gives us the productivity. So I call it a output to labour ratio, not labour productivity. Capital to output ratio that's fairly conventional, and then assumptions, an exogenous rate of the labour to output ratio, which is assuming continuous technological change. You can generalise that. I did that in my PhD. I recommend that you do that, but build a first model where you start with it, even as a constant will be fine. <coughs> An exogenous rate of growth of population. Again, if you go limits to growth, you have to include feedbacks affecting that, but this is a reasonable starting assumption. A constant capital output ratio. Empirically, that's pretty close to reality, but I'll show you why that's the case shortly. And then a uniform wage rate. All of those things can be generalised at a later stage. This is just your starting point. OK, so you do that. Now, try to read the line as it turns up on screen. I'm going horizontally. So the parts where I've got the triple sign is where it's definitional. So rate of change of the employment rate is rate of change of labour minus rate of change of population. I can now define L as Y minus A. So I take the N out of there as well. And I finally came out to the rate of change of the, of the, uh, the employment ratio is the rate of change of GDP minus the rate of change of the labour productivity and the rate of, sorry, labour productivity, I'll go, labour to output ratio and the rate of change of the uh, population. Same thing for the wage of share. Uh, one of my old mathematics lecturers used to have a great expression saying what you're getting here, once you get to this point, it's money for old rope. In other words, simply, it's literally mechanical. A monkey could do it. If you have Mathematica or MathCAD or the other programs that do symbolic logic, they can do it for you as well. But you finally get out saying the rate of change of the wages share of GDP is equal to the rate of change of wages minus the rate of change of the output to labour ratio. 
Now, uh, that just gives you two things to define, rate of change of GDP and rate of change of wages. Now, if you make the Leontiev assumption, and it's justified as a very, very well justified as a simplifying assumption, the rate of change of, of output is the rate of change of capital. So you've got to then define your rate of investment effectively. Now, Goodwin in 1967, and this is where I first started building my Minsky model, made the simplifying assumption that all profits are invested, which at a first pass is reasonable. Okay, this is the Rob Robinsonian, to some extent Marxian assumption about capitalists. So therefore, in gross investment, not net, because you, uh, you, you're not including depreciation here yet, which is, e is equal to profits, which is output minus wages, because you've got a two-class system here. You solve for K, then you start with the definition of the rate of change of capital as gross investment minus depreciation, and you can finally, do a set of substitutions, get down to the stage where you say the rate of growth of, uh, of the GDP is one minus the wages share, given that assumption that all profits are invested, divided by the capital output ratio minus depreciation. Now, you've only got wages to find left, left to define there, and what Goodwin used was a standard, wrong, but standard, linear Phillips curve. Please read Phillips's original papers. He's been bastardised by neoclassical, even worse than they bastardised Keynes. Very sophisticated thinker, an engineer applying his logic to, to economics. But as a first approximation, I use a linear, because it's actually easier to do stability analysis using a linear uh, Phillips curve. What you get is the final model for these two differential equations. Now, they're not quite expressed in differential equation terms yet because they've got one over lambda and one over omega on the left-hand side. So you put it in differential equation form, <coughs> and that's what you get. Now, that's actually Goodwin's model including depreciation, which Goodwin actually omitted. You simulate that in Minsky and you get cyclical behaviour. So again, I'll bring that up and show it quickly. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, let's make it full screen and simulate. And there's your cyclical behaviour. The two systems are running, you know, graphed on the x and y axis up here. The limit cycle that generates, which is that fixed orbit. It's not actually a limit cycle, it's called a fixed orbit. But anyway, um, but notice by the way that there's a phase difference between employment and wages share even though there's no time lag in the system whatsoever. Okay? Pe people, when you do the mechanical difference equation stuff, people think, oh, you've got to have time lags. No, there are phase differences in dynamic systems. That turns up quite easily there. So, on we go. And, the, I, I, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Was it, was it, was it They're very, it's very similar. The uh, wage share is the pink one, and employment is the green one. Okay. Now I see Goodwin's model as the alternative to Ramsey. Ramsey is the model all the neoclassicals build their stuff on. 1928 Ramsey paper, as James and I discussed a couple of days ago. Uh, and, and and I have played a role here. I have to apologise for this. It was wrongly characterised as being flawed, empirically not supported by the data, by a paper by a couple called David Harvey. And I was one of the referees. Okay. And so I, having built my Goodwin model, you know, that's why we've got some of the paper to referee, and a big table of econometrics and you know, all this proof that it's all, you know, doesn't fit the data at all, it's way off. And I thought, oh shit. <laughs> anyway, okay, well, it, he's done the econometrics well, so I've got to put up with it. Then a few years later, I thought, well, I want to do some empirical work now, so as much as I don't like the fact that it didn't fit the data, I'm going to use David's numbers. And then I tried to graph them. What the fuck is going on here? Absolutely crazy. So I got in touch with David and said, mate, I tried to use your numbers, and it's just crazy. What's happening? He said, I made a simple schoolboy error. I, I used percentages and forgot to divide by 100. Okay? So I told that to Matthias Griselli. A fabulous mathematician at, uh, who's a, a great fr fr friend of post Keynesian and MMT based at McMaster University in Canada. And he went through and just took that point aboard, did the econometrics as a mathematician would, or the statistics, properly, and said it restores the status of the Goulden model as a respectable starting point for more sophisticated dynamic models of growth cycles. So it is not invalid. Forget about Harvey. 
Uh, he's very apologetic about that particular mistake. But then you've got to look, how do you work out the Goodwin model? And I, I, when I first read Goodwin, I really couldn't make head nor tail of it. Goodwin, it was written in two pages flat, and I realised Goodwin is not a good writer overall. But then a guy called John Blatt, who was a professor of mathematics at New South Wales University, became aware of neoclassical economics. And that's a story worth r recording. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physics on two occasions in the 50s. He wrote the reference on quantum mechanics. So was a guy called Murray Kemp, who was a neoclassical economist at the same university who specialised in international trade theory. Murray, by the way, is a lovely human being and a great tennis player, okay, but a neoclassical economist. So anyway, Murray thought that his only real peer at New South Wales University was John, because they'd both been nominated for a Nobel Prize. So he invited Blatt along to a seminar of one of his Heckscher Olin style international trade theory models. John sat at the back. I wasn't there, by the way. I heard this in detail from people who were. I wish I had been there. So Murray finishes and then looks over the audience and sees John at the back and says, what do you think? And John was famously rude. And he said, with an Austrian accent, he was born in Austria, moved to America, and because of McCarthy, he moved to Australia. He said, that is the greatest load of rubbish I've sat through in decades. <laughs> If this is advanced economics, there's something seriously wrong with economics, and I intend finding out what it is. <laughs> okay. He marched off and then spent the next three years writing a book called Dynamic Economic Systems. He went right back to the physiocrats. He, in his opinion, the greatest economist of all time, is Francois Canet. Okay. Not Keynes, not Schumpeter, etc., etc. Beautifully written book. He may have been a prick face to face, what I've been told. Uh, but he was a brilliant communicator and it's a superbly written book. So I read that and I thought, right, okay, it's, it's a great foundation to, in, to include, build Minsky's model, you include debt and money in general. So that's what I did for my PhD. Uh, there's more tales I can tell about Goodwin and Minsky there, but I'll do that in question if anybody's interested. So you get your third dimension, the ratio of private debt to GDP. Now, you had this definition, and that again is a definition. Little d is big D divided by y. Differential with respect to time, and you get the private debt ratio will rise if private debt grows faster than GDP. Yeah, okay. Now, you need a simplifying assumption here to bring this in, and ironically, I haven't included in the presentation, but Fama and French did the empirical work for me. They showed empirically that the change in debt is the main driver of long term investment in American data. Okay. Uh, they never published the paper. You can find it as a working paper on the web, but that's what they concluded. So therefore, you can say the rate of change of debt is gross investment minus profits. <clears throat> so that, that's my starting point. And now I've got a bit of a dilemma because I've got D on the bottom axis rather than Y. And another thing from a great mathematician I was taught by said, there are three rules to mathematics. What have you got in your equation that you don't want? Get rid of it. What haven't you got that you want? Put it in there. Keep it balanced. Okay. So just multiply by y over y, the right-hand side, and rearrange. And what you get out of that, you now have y over d, which is the inverse of 1 over d. I'm using d subscript d for debt ratio there. Multiplied by the gross investment minus the profit share. That's your equation for the rate of change of debt. So now I've got three equations. And you simulate that. You now, as, as, to do it, you've got to have investment differing from profits. So at a simple level again, I have a wage change function which is a linear function of the level of employment. I bring a investment function which is a linear function of the rate of profit. You can make it capacity utilisation, anything else you like, okay? As long as you bring that third dimension in there. I prefer to work with the rate of profit. Sorry, and what, didn't you say before yeah? that all profits are investment? Yeah, yeah that's, I've got rid of that simplifying assumption. Oh, great. Yeah, see, one other thing with neoclassical work, your, your higher level simplifying assumptions are more absurd than your lower level because you're trying to maintain equilibrium all the way through when you're working with mathematically unstable systems. Okay? So you've got to assume that we're all the same to get a demand curve, for example. Okay? Mm -hmm. Individual level you, you assume an individual's income is not changed by altering relative prices. Fair enough. Aggregate, you've got to assume we're all identical and all the goods are the same as well. Sorry, that's not a simplifying assumption, that's a fantasy. And not a very interesting one. Yeah? Just very quickly, the investment function is then just saying that the higher profit, the higher 
Yeah, uh, after a certain point, you're going to invest more than profit, so you have to borrow money. Below that level, you're going to invest less than profit, so you can pay some of your debt off. And you can include consumption in there as well. All this stuff is generalizable, and it's a question of how much generalization is worthwhile for what you're trying to simulate. This is good enough for what I was doing. So that's, that's the set of equations. And I say it's Minsky's financial instability hypothesis because this generates what Minsky spoke about, plus one additional, actually two additional details. So what I see as Minsky's genius, and truly was genius, is that he could perceive that without the guidance of this mathematical model. Okay? He, and he and Schump, he, I see him as really being, in many ways, more Schumpeterian than, than Keynesian. But he, his vision was to explain the way in which debt can destabilise the system through a series of cycles. And that's what you get. So you simulate this model, and that's the behaviour you get. And I'm going to bring up the, uh, the model in Minsky again. So if I now simulate this, you'll see the cycles, the rising level of private debt happening. I've got the, I haven't actually got debt shown independently there. I'll actually bring that in, pardon me. Uh, so I just want to get the debt ratio. Where are we? Ah. <coughs> so you get the cyclical increase in the debt ratio. You also get something that Minsky didn't realise, and this is why I was saying the mathematics can give you guidance. Notice as the debt rises, the wage falls. Now that's a, that is actually a provable relationship, okay? which turns up in the empirical data as well. You notice also the cycles are diminishing in scale before they start to rise in scale. Now Minsky spoke about this. I, I thought when I simulated this, I'd see cycles getting bigger all the time. But they got smaller before they got bigger. And I first built this model in August of 1992, which is before neoclassicals invented the great moderation. So I finished my paper, which was published by Paul Davidson three years after I submitted the paper, uh, in the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics in 95. And at this stage, it was becoming apparent there was a slowdown in the cycles. But my comment about seeing a period of relative tranquility in a capitalist economy there's nothing other than a lull before the storm was directly inspired by the mathematics, not by the empirical data. And then the empirical data started to match the mathematics, which scared the pants off me. Anyway, on we go. And you find the cycles diminish for a while and then they rise. And then ultimately you have a breakdown. So you've got rising inequality, rising debt level meaning a falling workers' share, capitalist share being constant, cyclical, but around a constant level. And this income, increasing income going to bankers at the expense of workers, even though workers are doing no borrowing in the model. So that's, that's the dynamics there. And the properties, uh, actually, this property, when I, when, I was, when I built the model, I was still studying maths at uh, New South Uni with a, a great lecturer there called Bruce Henry, came head of department. And he said, well, that's the Pomo Manaville route to chaos. So mathematicians that discovered this same thing in turbulent flow in fluids, that initially there'd be a period of what they call laminar flow, and then it would get turbulent. And they've got a particular geometric way of explaining how it happened and so on. So what I discovered in the economy is a phenomenon you can find in fluid dynamics, strangely enough. Uh, but then the rising debt causing a falling worker share of income, and that was a puzzle to me until I had to write the New Economics of Manifesto. And I tried to reason through what's actually going on, and I've given an explanation in that 10 page section of the book as to why rising debt share causes a falling worker's share, even though workers are doing no borrowing. Mateus has generalised that, by the way, with, along with Gail Girard, to have a model where the workers are doing the borrowing, effectively for speculating on houses rather than capitalists, and they get similar dynamics coming out of it. Okay. So, so, what I've shown you is you can derive a macroeconomic model which fits the empirical data in the sense that the major phenomena we saw in the last 30 years turn up in the model. Why does it work? And the reason is that the structure of the economy determines most of its behaviour. Marx put this beautifully back in the, uh, uh, the, I think the 18th Brumaire. Men make their own history, but not as they please. Not under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances already existing. 
given and transmitted from the past. In effect, the structure of the economy, history matters. And history turns up in a system like this. By the way, I don't know how many of you have seen the work of Ole Peters and what's called the ergodic uh, uh, economics work. Look for a guy called Ole, O-L-E, Peters. And, it's, and he, he calls it the ergodic, he should call it the non-ergodic. He's, he's, he's a mathematician, he really understands what ergodic means. Okay? And he says what, mathemat- what economists use are ergodic systems, the real world is non-ergodic. So what you've seen there is non-ergodic. Um, But what you get is the definitions embody that structure and the initial conditions embody the history. So if you expand the definition, you bring in prices, which I've done, bring in multiple commodities, which I've also done but I haven't generalised with with debt levels, bring in the monetary system, bring in energy, bring in waste, you'll increase how well your model matches the real world. And that's what neoclassicals think they're doing but they fail because they try to hang on to this fetish of equilibrium. So, uh, and there's plenty of mathematical work to prove their equilibrium is unstable. So what they've done is that they, if you go back to Valra, he thought just an auctioneer would solve everything. An auctioneer which costs nothing, which is Maxwellian's, Maxwell's demon in mathematics and physics terms. But he thought, thought, a bunch of people in a room like this, working out what they've got to sell, what they want to buy, vector of relative prices, Auctioneer changes the prices, you'll converge to equilibrium. No, you won't. Okay? That's a mathematical theorem. It will, that process will not converge to equilibrium. It's unstable. Uh, but what they've done to compensate with that is go from having the market as all-powerful with dumb consumers okay, to consumers who are gods. Why the hell do they need a market? Okay? The market plays almost no role in their models these days. It's nonsense. So we can work from the structure of the economy, have simple behavioural rules, like the linear stuff I've shown you there beforehand, and you can, you can build realistic models. You don't have to make the mistakes they've made. Now, I understand it might be a bit complicated, so I want to show you can do it another way, and that's to actually start from uh, just a um, flow chart. And this is the other paradigm. I showed you the, this, this is the, the new version of Minsky, obviously. Uh, but I'm going to now put my little mask back on. Pardon me being paranoid about COVID, but I'm paranoid about COVID. I'm also flying off to Australia tomorrow and I don't want to find I can't get on the plane and I don't want to get there and find I can't have the operation because I have COVID, so it's on. That's for 20 people on Twitter who asked me why I did that. Okay, so what you want to do is to say, let's start with the employment. The employment. You just type the term there, click on OK. I've now got the word employment. Now, if I divide that by population, and I'm going to make, uh, I'll make population an integral block. Okay? So I bring this down here and rename that to population. And the way you define a, a differential equation in Minsky, a standard differential equation, is to take a copy of the variable and define it's a parameter I'll make that say 0.03 like a 2% a rate of population growth I won't bother making it variable here okay and you multiply that the population by the population growth rate and add it to the initial level of population so I'll call that pop O I'm going to get crazy cycles out of this, by the way. Uh, I'm almost certain of it because I'll, I'll put in numbers that don't quite make sense. If you're doing this stuff live, you never quite get it right. But there's your equation for population. If you want to graph it, then just attach to one of the inputs here. Oh, hang on. Uh-oh. Now that is a bug. I don't know why it's happening here. That is supposed to, supposed to be giving me... <coughs> All right, what is Russell? You have to see that, okay? Um, I'm just going to see how far I am to the recording here. 34 minutes in. Okay, that, sh- that, that should, that you, when you click inside the circle and drag, that should bring out an arrow. For some reason, it's not doing it. Let's see if I can do it from here. Ah, okay, I can. I'll take a copy of population, whack it over here, 
but that's something we need to work on for the integral block. You can also, if you want to save a bit of time, you can change the angle of uh, something like that. So I'll make it 270. Okay, so it just takes up less space. But I now simulate that and I'm getting exponential growth. You can see the curvature starting to develop this. That's population defined as a variable. And while I'm at it, I'll also define the uh, uh, out output to labour ratio. And you can put any, virtually any text you like, including a space. Um, uh, hang on, pardon me. I want to make that another integral block. So integral block, rename this Take a copy of it, modify that by a parameter. You can convert parameters into, into, into flows and uh, in, into integrals and so on if you wish to at any point in building a model. But I'll, let's say there's a 1.5% rate of growth of, 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 of uh, Tech, of, tech, of the uh, capital labor, the output to labor ratio over time. Modify those. Hang on. Modify those together. Attach that at the top of the integral block. Type in your initial level. Make that one. I won't bother graphing that, but what you now get, you'll see the numbers changing over time. They're going exponentially. So you have got employment, population, and uh, output. You want to define a model. So if I just change the scale, scale here, I'll drag these down a bit, just to make space. So now divide employment by population. Oh, this is the, an improvement in the latest version of the program too. I'll just change the scale so you can see this, make a bit of a... Click on variable and one of the options there is browser and what you get is a window where all the elements of the model come up. You can turn off, like you don't want to see parameters, you can just click that box and parameters disappear. Okay? Uh, stocks, etc, etc, integrals, get rid of them, Okay, but I want to use them. So I've now got the population, so click on population, drag it over here, and now I'm going to start using uh, Lambda. Okay, so to so type Greek, you type a backslash and then the English expression of the Greek word. And that's now a variable. Just click on OK. So now I've got... What is that up there? Ah. Okay, so I've now got the employment rate. Now, I'm going to now subtract that. If I type a minus key, by the way, Minsky, in first of all, that you might be typing in a text string that starts with minus. But if you press the enter key, it becomes a minus, a minus operator. So I have employment here, employment rate, and I'm going to define lambda z to zero, meaning at what level of, of the employment rate the workers not demand wage rises or not get wage rises. And make that a parameter and say make that 0 0.6. So I now subtract that from employment. I've now got the gap between the current employment rate and the rate at which there's no wage rises. And I want to now multiply that by a slope. What's the slope of that linear function? Give it a value of 10. And now press, just press the multiply key, it turns up on the canvas. So that is now your rate of change of wages. So I type, say, capital D for delta, and say delta uh, underscore W, lowercase, because I'm talking the wage rate rather than the wage bill. OK. There's your rate of change of wages. Now I now have to bring in wages as a differential equation. So bring another differential equation down here. 
edit this to be W for the wage rate and take a copy of that and multiply it by the rate of change of wages integrate that you have the wage of course you need an initial wage as well so wage underscore zero I'm working in real terms here you can make it uh, nominal quite let's say for 0 0.9 so now I've got the wage wage bill and I've also got employment and this is where it takes to be money for old rope as my old mathematics lecturer used to say so take a copy of employment multiplied it by the wage bill you have wages. Hang on, I press the escape key. Got to press the these days. You got to type the enter key when you get this little define window coming up. So that's wages. Now I need output. I haven't got output yet, but I'll get there. I'll just define output first of all. So output minus wages, I'm going to do the simple Goodwin model here. I won't try doing Minsky unless I get more time. Okay, that's profit. And I'm going to make Goodwin's assumption that profit becomes investment. Put that down here. Now to make it cyclical, I can flip that around attach profit here the lines when you see a blue dot click on the blue dot or anywhere you like actually and you can then stretch stuff around that's now investment of course investment is the rate of change of capital stock uh oh what have I done I clicked on the differential block first of all uh, there's a differential right okay let's get rid of that one so if I now have depreciation, and I'll just I'll use use delta underscore k for that, give that a value of say six percent. I've now got to flip that around too. So I now have investment minus depreciation. I need capital. This is going to be capital here. So just edit that to be capital. take a copy of that so I multiply depreciation rate by capital I'm going to looks like flipping isn't happening automatically we've got to fix that up as well once we flip we want everything to go in the same direction minus key here so investment minus depreciation is the level of capital I need a, I need a capital zero so I'll type K underscore zero Let's uh, make that say, I don't know, 300 units. Yeah, that's another thing to fix up. We've got to make that. Uh, that did happen automatically in the previous version. Once you flip once, everything done after that got flipped. That's obviously not happening in the new version. Divide by key, flip that. So capital, ah, hang on. We've got to feed that up here. That's my initial capital. Okay, divide capital by your capital output ratio make another parameter, give that a value of 3 flip that around divide that that is now output, so take a copy of output from here flip that there's output uh, now the uh, I need my Capital, my labour output ratio, which is this one. Hang on. Flip that. Divide. You can see why we want to make it automatic once you've started reversing direction, that the flip is done for you by the program rather than you having to do it every time. Bring it to scale. So I've now got employment. Now I'm probably stuffed up, 
doing this stuff live always tends to give you mistakes. Make a bit of space there. Let's just see if it works or not. Make a graph. Oh, that's that's a, a, a data sheet. Pardon me. I clicked on the wrong thing. Graph there. Uh, let's bring down the wager share of output there, and the employment rate over here. And pray. Yep. There you go. Crazy cycles. That's the wage rate rather than the wage of share. I haven't defined that yet. Okay, how long will it take me? 15 minutes? Now, it'll take you maybe 20, if you haven't done it before. But it's very fast to design a model. Once you've done that, I mentioned you get the equations being generated over here. You can export those into a tech file and import that into, into a math type in Word, etc., etc. So it's self documenting. Uh, you get a set of plots, you can then lay out as you wish on a screen and print those out as well. If you had godly tables, you'd have them here, but you haven't got godly tables yet, but we'll solve that problem. Not here, I'll just go back and show it. Uh, but once I've done that, that's a couple of models. And you can see one of them using a godly table. Okay? So all the uh, internal dynamics are done through the godly table. I made that a bit too small to have got borrowing, increasing debt, and increasing money in the firm sector. Interest being paid from the firms to the banks. Wage is being paid to workers, workers consuming and banks consuming. So the same basic thing I showed you beforehand is running through a godly table. It's stock flow consistent. I used to get accused that a model was not stock flow consistent. I'm sorry, it is. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the way the system works. And what about lags? Sam asked me this yesterday. Well, a typical lag model, this is the multiplier accelerator model, which is a bad model, by the way, provably bad. Um, I'll explain why if anybody wants to know later. Now, Minsky, and I've got it deliberately, does not support time lag because it's actually the same reason I won't uh, give a child crack cocaine for breakfast. Okay? It's a bad habit. Don't let a kid touch the fireplace. Uh, I don't let you use periods because you shouldn't use periods. It's simply bad logic. And I explain in great detail in the manifesto, but one of the obvious things that everybody uses T and T minus one, where one is years, okay? Now for investment, sure, okay, you can lag it by that a year, makes sort of sense. Lag consumption by a year, what the hell are you smoking? Okay, well, that's a mistake everybody makes. You bring in false dynamics out of it, false time sequences, and it stuffs up the model. So I have what I call the keen rant in the, in the manual on Minsky about why you shouldn't use it. And there is an alternative called the time lag. It's actually the correct term in mathematics. What economists do is a time delay. So a time lag says to find a new variable. There's your original variable. Let's say that's the rate of profit. If this is an investment function where capitalists are reacting with a lag to the rate of investment. That is your lagged variable. This here is the time lag measured in years. And then you make investment depend upon that lag response and you've got your lag model. Now if you do it, this is just showing it with a sign, with a sign, with a, they say, I'm feeding in a sine wave just to show what happens. And I've got a lag of half a year. And you get, you can see the red and the blue line are different. So if you want to bring in lags, if it makes sense, you can bring it in. But most of the dynamics you see in the real world is a response to current situations. So there's a, a lag in how fast workers realise employment's rising, for example. Okay? There are those lags there. But you have to work very seriously with lags. They do bring in another form of instability into a system. So it's safer to start without them and then bring them in later, but it's very easy to do. And there's that, what, what it's actually called in engineering is the time constant. If you imagine if you were designing a car, a car has to have springs for its wheels to cope with the road having potholes. Okay? It's how fast the spring response is a physical parameter and a constant, therefore, of the spring that's designed for the car. So that's why they call them time constants. But they can be time variables. You can make them variables, you can make them change in a system uh, if you want to. <coughs> but that's the basic logic is there. And I've, that's, I've, I'll send this presentation to everybody here, or through the organisers. So I explain how to use them in modelling in Minsky as, as well. Um, now, the reason I rushed through the demo of building a model is I want to talk about energy. And neoclassical economics is energy blind. They, when they, Cobb Douglas production function has technology times capital times labour no role for energy. Uh, and of course, as we all know in this room, it's based on the marginal productivity theory of income distribution. So capital gets about 
used to get about 30%, now it's about 40%, but they still use 0.3 in most of their models as the exponent for capital. Now, when they include energy, they do exactly the same thing. They say, what's the uh, energy share of the economy? It's about 4%. So if they bring it in, they simply add E on the end there, 1 minus alpha minus beta because of the constant returns of scale, which is about the only decent assumption they make. Uh, and they therefore tell you that a 10% fall in energy would cause only a 0.4% fall in GDP. Now, I have to thank Rudy Backman, who's a leading neoclassical economist, for meaning that I no longer have to say that's what they would do, because he's done it. Paper in 2022. And said that uh, uh, if there's a change in, in uh, energy of 10%, that will cause a 4% fall in a 0.4% fall in GDP, according to the strict Cobb Douglas. He uses the a CES function. Notice, by the way, he got his arithmetic wrong. Point zero, 0 0.025, which I think is we've got the 4 and divided into 100 at some point. That is not 0 0.004. Okay, so a bit of a laugh there. But anyway. Um, but when you look at it, the, the reason it's blind, and we were also blind to this issue, is that we imagine you can produce output just using labour and capital. Now, you can't. And this little phrase occurred to me while at my good friend Bob Ayer's place in Paris, which was full of statues. Labour that energy is a corpse. Capital of that energy is a sculpture. So what that means is you replace K with number of machines, which of course is an abstraction. Okay? Capital controversies apply to some extent, but this is not involved in income distribution. So it's not as bad for post-Keynesians to use K as it is for neoclassicals to use K. <coughs> Number of machines times the energy consumption per machine per year times how much of that energy is turned into useful work. And the same thing for labour. So there's your units, there's your energy consumption, and there's your efficiency of using it. Now, of course, the amount of energy we consume here is orders of magnitude more than we put into work itself. Most of you are probably consuming 20,000 watts, 10, 20,000 watts a day. The most you can put out on a constant rate is about 100 per hour. So, whereas a, a Roman slave might have consumed 200 and got, you know, put out 100. So, I treat L times EL, so EL times little here is a constant. And then when you do the derivation in the Cobb Douglas model, what you get is a constant based on the labour component multiplied by energy raised to the coefficient not of its percentage share in GDP anymore, but of the capital share. Now that is 10 times the coefficient they use. That's useful work. So that alone drastically modifies their model. They need to increase the factor they use for, for energy by a factor of 10 of what they actually use. Okay? Now, that's not enough either. And I must say, I have read one neoclassical paper that I recommend reading because it says something useful. This paper by Mankiw in 1995. He did a cross-country comparison of, energy, of, of, uh, of capital and labour, living out energy, and he tried to work out how he could modify it by bringing in human capital theory. But that's a waste of time. But what he did was he said, to make the fit the data, the coefficient for capital has to be not 0 0.3 but 0 0.8, which in the complex of production is so close to one that we're almost talking Leontier. Okay? So if you do that, the energy coefficient goes from being 10 times what they use to 20 times what they use, and therefore applying, sticking in their world, a 10% fall in energy would mean an 8% fall in GDP. But you look at the data, and no, a 10% fall in energy will mean a 10% fall in GDP. This is, that's the, the horizontal, the, the, the uh, x-axis there is world energy consumption in kilotons of, of oil equivalent, I think, and the vertical is world GDP in American uh, dollars from the World Bank 2010. 0.997 correlation, but of course those are two increasing series. You do your change, it's 0.83. Okay. And notice they're on the same scale. It's a one-for-one -one relationship. Okay. So who does that confirm? Leontiev. The model we all use in post-Keynesian work makes empirical sense when you now look at energy conversion because what you've got is we're saying its output is capacity utilisation times capital divided by capital output ratio. 
And that's an empirical regularity that Leontie have spotted, and we've all used that ever since. But what's the explanation? Well, you bring in the same k times ek times little ek there, and put output in terms of energy. That's what I'm bringing in for q there. And then you can make a conversion from the usual term we use, which is effectively widgets, you know, why the sort of composite commodity, widgets there. So there's energy content per widget is the ek. So there's your output in widgets, the usual thing we put in all our models. There's output in energy terms. There's the energy content per widget. And you work out what ek has to be, it ends up being 1 over v. So what we're being used in the capital output ratio is actually the efficiency with which machinery turns energy into useful work. And so that's all you have to do to make post-Keynesian economics consistent with the role of energy in production. Okay? It's a minor tweak. It's basically a redefinition of a constant we've been using for a long, long time. So that's the energy aware Leontia production function. So neoclassicals have to get rid of their theory of income distribution, which they're not going to do, are they? We can just go straight ahead what we currently do, and rather than using 1 over v, we use e, e, e the little k, and we're in, we're in the right, right ballpark. We get the 10% fall in energy, or mean a 10% fall in global GDP. So it's implicitly, the work we do is implicitly energy aware. And of course, once you've got that in there, your waste output is 1 minus your efficiency. Now, what that means, you can make it explicitly energy aware models in post Keynesian economics. And I've done that work with uh, Matthias Roselli and Tim Garrett. So that's a Minsky model including energy as the input and also therefore having a fixed amount of resources which deplete over time so you can have a breakdown. And but the thing of course, energy is, that's still an abstraction. We don't work in terms of pure energy. We use a fair bit of it in our, our daily lives. Okay, we're taking energy and converting it into a useful form. But we also do that to matter. And I was stuck as to how do we do that. Because if you go back and see where did ISLM come from, it came from a 1935 paper by Hicks, which <coughs> tried to build a model of a production economy involving a consumable commodity, for which he chose bread, and then machinery, for which he chose fuck, what I choose for machinery. Okay? What he chose was stale bread. Okay? And he gave up, so he made it, that's where the equilibrium concepts, the wall raising equilibrium that gave us ISLM came from that paper written in 35, before, of course, he read a word of Keynes. That's what he admits in ISLM an explanation. Has anybody in this room not read ISLM an explanation? Yay. Oh, a few of you haven't. All right. That's your reading for the afternoon. Okay. Although maybe tomorrow. So we put that together and we got a Goodwin model involving matter and energy, which I've got to write up. That's my next major research task. And then the thing is to generalise that to multiple commodities, multiple forms of waste and so on and so forth. So I've done that with a report which uh, I've embedded inside there. So if you want to read the report, just run the, run, run the file, click on that when it comes up and you can download the PDF. Um, so we, ha we have all the materials we need for a monetarily aware, energy aware, matter aware approach to economics and it's time we kick the neoclassicals off the front stage. Thank you. Any questions, including have I gone over time? Am I alright? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you? Yeah. Um, you spoke in the beginning of, or in one of the first few slides about the depth versus weight ratio, which yeah. developed in the direct entry having initially yeah. expected. Could you elaborate a little bit? Yeah. Um, and that for when, when you, when you see, yeah. When you see the model that Goodwin did, there are only two social classes. So profit share goes up, wage share must go down. Okay? But what drives the whole system, and Marx got this right, by the way, forget the later theory of value, that's bullshit, but he got this right. He said capitalism is driven by investment. Okay? It's an investment-driven system. So in my simple model, what I had was, there's just with a linear relationship, there's some point on that linear curve, say a profit rate of, say, 3% or 4%, which is a profit share of about 12 or 16%. When it hits that level, capitalists invest, invest exactly what they earn in profits. Above that, by borrowing money, below it, they pay that off. Now, what it means is each time in the cycle you get back to that point, that's the level of investment that applies. 
So that gives you a, a constant relationship between profit share and investment as a percentage of GDP. And then the remainder goes to, now in a three-class system, bankers or workers. Now, if you have a rising share going to bankers, that means a falling share going to workers, and capitalists couldn't give a shit who takes the rest. So what you get is, every time you get, the, the stability is driven by the, the, the investment determining everything else. So the stability for the profit, capitalists is around that profit share, and they'll cycle around it until the system collapses with too much debt. Okay? But work, as the debt level goes up, the worker share falls. You look at the empirical data, that's what turns up in the American data as well. Do you include interest? Sorry? Do you include interest? Oh, yeah. Well, they, otherwise it wouldn't happen. Yeah. Okay. The, 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 the income expression is output, profit is output minus wages minus interest on debt. Yeah. So you've got to have the interest rate inside there. Yeah. Yes, James. So, I mean, differing on the issue of the labor theory value for um, quite a few decades now. Um, Did I read my back on it? Sorry, well, yes, I did. Well, I don't have to go around debunking, of course. You can read, um, read, the, read the paper the more Yeah, you well, Adam's got a, quite a good paper showing that the um, analysis in capital is quite consistent. Yeah. Um, and due to Baranos, has got it wrong way back by complaining what he was doing. It's got nothing to do with Chicken Baranowski. Yeah. And that comes through in measures of things like total factor productivity, and of course you distance yourself from. You know, Mar Marx's Marx's dialectics contradict the labour theory of value. His philosophy. Uh, can we just get back to this issue of the production function? No, for, for production fu production function. I get a similar thing when I include it, but what I'm saying is Marx thought he derived the labour theory of value from his dialectics, and in fact they contradict it. What what you get out of is any input as a source of surplus. The labour theory of value fundamentally says surplus comes from exploiting labour. And therefore that's why you get the capital out, the capital labour ratio, organic composition of capital, etc. etc. When you look at his dialectics properly, and I only I gloss over it in debunking, read the, my thesis or the, the two papers I had published on that, it actually it, it contradicts his underlying theory. And when you bring in energy, it says that neither labour nor capital is the source of value. The source of value is we're exploiting free energy, which we find on the planet, and we then fight over the distribution of that, as wage, wage and you know, dis fights over the distribution of income, it really fights over the distribution of energy. So <coughs> uh, that's a whole can of worms, mate. So, but before I get into that can of worms, do read my papers, not just debunking. Well, uh, I, I suppose I draw on Enrique Dussel. I draw on Enrique Dussel, who um, goes back to Shelley, because um, when Shelley took over Hegel's chair after Hegel's death, yeah. he began um, talking on the philosophy of revelation. And that influenced Marx and his critique of Hegel. So Dussel sort of goes through all the <coughs> manuscripts that contributed to <coughs> capital, including theories of surplus value, the Mundrisa, and the unpublished manuscripts, and argues that, if not directly from Shelley, certainly by a Feuerbach, um, Marx um, had this conception of labour as the sole source of creativity, which underpins its sort of analysis of the labour theory of value. So, um, yeah, one of Dussel's papers was published in the um, Review of Political Economy. Um, I've read it. Um, um, it's Marx's own logic. He contradicts that it. it's on page 267 of the Grundrisse in a one and a half page long footnote. And he then makes the error about 60 pages later where he equates what he derived, where he actually said at one point, it's not this that commodity or that commodity, but all commodities, which are the source of surplus. And that was actually correct. And he said, and the essence of all commodities is they're made from labor, which is an error. It's an error within Marx's own logic. Um, so, you know, that's why you know, one of the many reasons I dismissed the labor theory of value. Okay, well, we can, um we will, <laughs> over a beer, but in another country. Sure. Yeah. Um, with that slow breakdown, um, one of your models, the, um, the, the employment share peaked before the wage to GDP ratio peaked, mm. uh, which is something that um, could be elaborated on. 
it's for the same reason that sign peaks before cause, or part the other way around. Uh, they are intimately connected, but out of phase. So in a dynamic system, what, what economy, this is one reason I can't stand co-integration research, okay? Because co-integration say, well, if they don't co-integrate at the first difference, take the second and the third and the fourth and find a point at which they are sort of moving in parallel. If you co-integrate sine and cosine a thousand times, they will still be out of phase. Okay? But the same dynamic system is defining both of them. So the whole idea that you can eliminate that is a sign of how badly we've been trained by mathematical economists, who actually are better described as mathematical economists. It's just part of a dynamic system. Uh, if you actually look at it, and this I've got to be more elaborate, if you look at the, the rate of in, point of inflection in the curve, that's where well one peaks. Okay? So if you, if you look at the way, where one's going up, and you find the point where it reaches inflection, the other turns at that point. The peak of one is the inflection of the other. 